Well, I have to sorry about the, the fact that I didn't place the material at the reserve. Uh, I thought that I, I placed all the material. So this afternoon, we're going to have the remaining material at the reserve, hopefully. And uh, you can also reach that through e-reserve e from, from the campus only, of course. You cannot reach uh, those collections from an, a computer uh, outside the, the campus. OK. Uh, today, I'll continue with the, uh, with the model. Now, just let me refresh your memories. What we are doing is simply the following. We have a certain, well, we are trying to quantify the bullwhip effect. This is the overall topic. And in order to show this bullwhip effect, we have a certain demand model that we are using, which, has, uh, which is written in the following form. Let me rewrite that demand model. So dt in general is d plus rho times d t minus 1 plus ut, where rho is correlation coefficient in between minus 1 and 1. And d is sort of a mean which is pretty large compared to the, to the remaining terms. ut uh, is a normally distributed error term with mean 0 and variance sigma square. And as I told you before, d is much greater than sigma, which means that the chances of this process going to negative values is rather small. Now, this is a very typical non-stationary kind of process, where non-stationarity is dependent on the previous period's demand. This is a simple structure, but I think it's a structure to validate the fact that we have bullwhip effect. So we, we are trying to show that. Now, given that we have all this information, note that we know that demand is following this specific distribution structure. Given that we know this, what's going on is what we are going to show is we are going to show that the variance of orders which are given to the second echelon is always going to be larger than the variance of the actual demand. So we want to show that this is larger than 1, and we want to show how is it, it is related to the parameters of the demand model. So by showing this, what we are showing is actually we are showing that there is a bullwhip effect going on. Now, the variance of demand should be computed, but how are we going to find the variance of orders that we actually submit? What we are assuming is we are assuming that given the system, we know how to optimally operate the system. And to optimally operate the system under a periodic review situation, we find an order up to level. Okay. And if you recall, we were able to find out the order up to level, which is S star. And this S star is actually QW1 inverse and where this QW, Q sub, nu plus 1 is the demand over lead time plus the review period. Okay? And the, the term that we have inside, the, the percentile value that we have is C1 minus beta divided by beta to the nu divided by H plus pi where h and pi's are the costs that we are already familiar. So this is the optimal solution. Now, this is what we have done up to uh, last, period, uh, last time on Tuesday. Now, what we are going to do this is, this is the order up to level. Now, by using this order up to level, we're going to find the distribution of the quantity that we are going to give the order for the first period only, because this is non-stationary. And given that we find the distribution of the quantity that we are going to order, which is dependent on the demand process, of course, we will be able to write this variance of Q. And then we will find variance of demand, and we will simply take the ratio. So this is, this is the objective that we have. Now, last time, if you recall, we were able to write the following. Again, this is what we had last time. 
an arbitrary demand dk can be written in terms of d0, the starting inventory level. And if you recall, this was d, 1 minus rho to the power k divided by 1 minus rho. And then we have rho to the power k, d0. And plus we have a, a, a final term, which is the term that considers the errors in each demand. And this is i from 1 to k, rho to the power k minus i, u i. And this is true for all k values that are greater than or equal to 1. So what I have is, I have a representation of dk in terms of the error terms in the, in the demand models, which are normally distributed with mean 0 and variance sigma square, and they are independent of each other. That's, that's the way that the problem is structured. In other words, you have a relation between demand terms, but the error terms are independent through periods. Now, you have to make an assumption. So basically what this means is that if there is any dependency between the demands of consecutive periods, you put that dependency on the demand terms rather than the error terms. In other words, you, we have the tendency of assuming that the errors that we make when we are predicting the demand is, or when, when demand uh, the, with, with, the realis with the actual realization of demand, is independent. But what is dependent is that if you give me a value of d, next period I know that my demand is going to be dependent of, on this d, not on the error term. Okay, so the errors are independent. So this is, this is a very uh, easy way of representing the demand, but it's very realistic as well. Okay, so this is the extent that we, uh, we did last time on Tuesday. Now, what we are after is, actually, we are after the demand during lead time plus review period. So what we, we are after is simply summation i from 1 to nu plus 1 of d sub i. So this is actually new. This is something that we didn't do last time. So we are interested in this demand. And as you can see, this demand is going to be some of these dk's. Now, what can you say about the distribution of dk, any of the individual d's? Let's look at the terms. Here, everything is constant. Here, you, it is dependent on a previous demand, but it is, it is a constant. There is no randomness. So the only randomness comes from ui. Ui's are normally distributed random variables. So what you have is each dk is a normally distributed random variable because you have some of normally distributed random variables. So it means that you have each dk is a normally distributed random variable. So what happens if I take some of dk's over, or some of di's, then I will again have a randomly distributed, uh, normally distributed random variable. Okay, so, but what is the difference? Well, I know that di and di plus 1 and hence di plus 2 are all related, so there will be some kind of a covariance term. Okay, but still, I can write the following. This is normally distributed. Let's say that I have a mean m. I'm showing this with a large m. And with a variance, which is usually uh, shown to be as capital sigma. This is capital sigma, actually. The summation sign is capital sigma. Okay, now... In this case, if I can find what this, these terms are, then I will be able to find out what the distribution of this Q sub uh, uh, nu plus 1 is. Because this is the distribution of the demand over lead time plus the review period. So this distribution turns out to be normal. Okay? And I am now specifying the mean and the variance of that distribution. So the mean of that distribution is simply summation of this term over all k values, or over all i values from 0 to, from 1 to k. And if we do this, actually, m is going to be d times summation 
i from 1 to nu plus 1 of 1 minus rho to the power i divided by 1 minus rho. And then I'm going to have summation of this term over all k's. Now I can write this explicitly. So this is going to be 1 minus rho to the power nu plus 1 divided by 1 minus rho times d0. And I have a rho in the beginning. Okay. And then I'm going to have summation. Well, if you're, you're taking the expected value, what is the, what is the expected value of these u's? Zero. So we don't have any other term. So this is going to be the mean of the distribution. The ui's have zero expected value. How about sigma? Well, sigma is, of course, the, the, the variance. It's going to be a little bit more complicated. But still, what we have is these terms are constants. So we are only going to be uh, looking at this term. So we are going to have two summation. One of them will be i from 1 to, let's say, k from 1 to nu plus 1. And then I am going to have i from 1 to k, OK, that term, rho to the power k minus i times uh, OK, and so this is, well, I can, I can rewrite this, actually. So this is going to be rho. Well, I need, I'm taking the variance, so it turns out that these, are, these constants should be uh, multiplied by itself, because you're taking the variance. So variance of a times the random variable is a squared times the variance of the random variable. So we have 2k minus i. And then I'm going to have sigma square. Now, what, what about the covariance terms here? Well, it turns out that we don't have any covariance terms because ui's are independent. So it turns out that this term is much simpler than uh, what we thought. This is the way that we can write the variance. So once we have this variance, of course, now I can specify uh, my order up to levels. In other words, I know that now this is a normally distributed random variable. Now I can write the normally distributed random variable in an easier way, okay? And, and such as like you have mean plus sigma times a constant, uh, and that constant is going to be the standard normal value in the table that corresponds to this fractile. So if I do that, then S1, let me write it here. So S1 star, now I'm only interested in the first ordering quantity, OK, at this point. So S1 star is simply going to be the expected value. So let me write M here, the expected value, plus I will have a K star OK, and let this be the capital K star, times sigma. And I'm going to have these two summations. So summation k from 1 to nu plus 1, summation i from 1 to k of sigma, uh, excuse me, rho to the power 2k minus i where k star actually satisfies this equation. Where is that? OK. The star equation. In other words, this is the this term fractile that corresponds to the in, in standard normal tables. OK, now at this point, what I have done is I have specified everything that I need to, to find out. So you see that the quantity that you order up to is, a, is actually a constant. And 
of course, the quantity that you order specifically, this is the order up to level, it's a constant, but the quantity that you order is going to be dependent on the demand that you have seen before. Okay? In other words, depending on the demand value, if the previous demand was large, you would order a small quantity, a, a large quantity in order to reach this order up to level. If demand was small, uh, if demand was uh, small, then you would order a small quantity to reach order up to level. So you can see that the order up to level is constant, but the quantity that we order is a random variable that depends on the previous demand. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. We have a square root there. Thank you. Is it, is it okay now? Yeah. I always forget the square root. Okay, now, uh, so what can you say about Z1 star then? Z1 star, the quantity that you actually order, the optimal quantity to order, is going to be S1 star, okay, minus S0 star, which was the previous order up to point, and then I'm going to have D0. Why is this true? With the previous order up to level, I brought, this is the order up to level, remember, it's the order up to level before you actually see the demand. Okay? So this is the, so it means that once you see the demand, this is going to be the quantity in the, in the inventory. Okay, in, in terms of the inventory position. So this, this was the uh, order up to point, okay, before I actually see the demand. So after the demand, this is going to be my inventory position. Now I want everything to be raised to this level. So the difference is going to be what I'm going to order. Okay? So this is actually what I order. Now, if you write this in this fashion, What's happening here is, is quite interesting because the term that you have here in the variance term, note that whether it is S1 star or S2 star is not going to change. So the order up to level is the same up to some terms. Now we have, look at M, the, the first part of M. It's not going to change with time. Okay, this is sort of a constant part. This part is going to change with the previous demand value. Okay? And how about this one? This is not going to be affected by the demand values. So when you take the difference between S1 star and S0 star, actually the only term that comes into picture is this one. Remains, because the others are going to cancel. So what we are going to have will be simply Z1 star is equal to rho, okay, 1 minus rho to the nu plus 1 divided by 1 minus rho. And now I'm going to have d0 minus d minus 1, the previous demand, okay, the previous demand that I had, because I have to write this, I am going, what I'm doing is I have to write as sub 0 in terms of the demand which is seen before. So this is going to be this term. And then I'm going to have d0. So this is the so-called equation 3.3 in the paper. Now, what I need to do the comparison is, now I am going to compute the variance of z1 star, and I am going to compare it with the variance of the demand. Okay, so what I wrote Q is the quant ordering quantity, but now I'm more specific. I'm going to take the variance of Z1 star and compare it to variance of D. Now, well, we know what the variance of D is. 
because that, that's basically, well, we are going to now compute these variances more specifically. Now I'm going to use this term here, and I'm going to use the definition of the demand. Now what can you say about this term here? We have d0, d1. Okay, it turns out that I need to compute the covariance of this term with d0. Okay, and I, 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 will, I will do step by step actually. Okay. So next step is to start computing variance of z1. So I'm going now to compute variance of z1 star. To be more specific, excuse me, I'm going to compare it with variance of d sub 0. Because that's the last demand observation that I have. And now this is the last observation that I have with respect to the order quantity. And I'm going to take the variances and make computations. Okay. Now, uh, so let's start with variance of Z1 star. Now, the variance of Z1 star, if I use this term, will be variance of D0. Now, I have two terms here. So I have to take the variance of the first term, the variance of the second term, and then I have a covariance term, which takes into account D0, the, these two terms. So this is simply going to be variance of D0, plus I'm going to have rho, 1 minus rho to the nu plus 1 divided by 1 minus rho. And this whole thing is squared times variance of d0 minus d minus 1. OK? Variance of these two. And then I'm going to have plus 2 the covariance term. So the constants are going to come out. And then I'm going to have covariance of d0 with d0 minus d minus 1. OK, so I have these three terms. Now, of course, you can see that this is not going to be 0. This is d0, d0 minus d minus 1. So I am simply taking the covariance of this random variable with this difference random variable, OK? Now, uh, and at that point, I need to compute, actually, the variance of d0. Well, using the model, variance of d0, which is equal to variance of d minus 1, actually, all dk's, is simply sigma squared divided by 1 minus rho squared, OK? This, is, this you can compute from the model. OK? So this is from, from the demand model. Well, actually, all of them will be from the demand model. But you can see that you can make this computation. Remember UIs. You are simply going to collect the D terms together, because it's a, uh, the error term uh, is, is stationary and independent. So this makes the whole process, actually, a, a process where the total variance is constant. So the variance of each of those are going to be identical. So if it is identical, remember the formula. We have d1 is equal to uh, d plus rho times d0 plus u0. This is the model. No, uh, u1. Am I right? Yes, this should be u1. So what happens is that then as the variances are the same, so you take these on, on this side. So you have 1 minus rho d is equal to d plus u1. Now you take the variance of both sides. So variance of d is going to be, well, I think I made, uh, let's see. Let me check the, the paper. Uh, I'm not sure about one term. Okay. Where is that? Up, up, up. Let's 
So, sigma square minus 1 minus rho square. Why is this? Uh, uh, I'm a little bit confused about this term. There might be a mistake in the paper because there are a few mistakes in that paper, I know. So I am expecting that this is going to be 1 minus rho, the whole thing squared, rather than 1 minus rho squared. But I have to check that. Uh, please bear with me with this, and I'm going to present this result on Tuesday. Just make this note, OK? Uh, the, the computation of this, I'll, I have to check uh, with the paper again. But in the paper, it is 1 minus rho squared. So it comes from the demand process, but I have to make sure that there is nothing wrong in the paper, or if there is a mistake in the paper, I will correct it, okay? So this is going to be what, what we come up with. Now, how about the other term, the, the covariance term? Now, first of all, what is the variance of d0 minus d minus 1? How are we going to compute that? Well, it turns out that you have a uh, how are we going to, to, to do this computation? So again, you have to bear with me. I'm not going to do that because if there is a mistake, then uh, the whole thing might be different. But just following from the paper, this is given as 2 rho squared divided by 1 plus rho. Okay. So it means that I have to check that as well because all my derivations were based on uh, the same thing. Okay. So now I notice that it, there is a little bit difference from the text and my derivations. Okay, and hence, if I write the covariance term, so this is d0, d minus 1 with d0, this covariance term is equal to sigma square divided by 1 plus rho. So you can actually derive this from the demand models. And if I'm not mistaken, they have done the same thing as well, uh, referring to an original paper which uh, presents this demand model, actually. So uh, I think I have to go back to that paper, otherwise it will be difficult to figure out whether there is a typo or I'm making a mistake. Okay. So these are the results from the demand model. So once you have this, then you, you can see that you can plug into this equation. Now, the interesting part is that here we already see the effect on the, uh, of the bullwhip because the variance of Z1 star is simply variance of D sub 0. Remember, this is, these are the two quantities that we want to compare. And then you have a positive term coming in, and then you have another positive term coming in. So you can see that variance of Z1 star is always larger than variance of d sub 0. Now, uh, of course, there are some interesting conclusions that we can have. And that is, so uh, in order to write up those conclusions, what I will do is I will write uh, the, the, the final result. And then we will see what happens if rho is equal to 1, what happens if rho is equal to minus 1, what happens if lead time is 0, things like that can be found out. So let me quickly go over those. So the final term then is going to be, if I replace everything into the final term, the final term is going to be variance of z1 star is equal to variance of d0 plus, then I have a positive term, which is 2 rho times 1 minus rho to the power nu plus 1 times 1 minus rho to the power nu plus 2 divided by 1 plus rho, and then I have 1 minus rho squared times sigma squared. So here you see we have 1 minus rho squared, so probably there is a typo in the paper. But I have to show that before, well, next time. Okay? So 
I think I was right probably, but let's see. Okay, now this is the term that we obtain. So we can do a number of different types of analysis. For example, now if you recall in the model, rho value was selected in between minus 1 and 1, and, but we didn't have rho is equal to 1 or minus 1 case exactly. Because uh, in the derivation of the original model, you have these type of terms in the denominator. So in order not to be, uh, not, not to have any problems with respect to dividing to 0, it's already restricted. But you can see that if the rho value is close to minus 1, Okay. Now, what we are having is, is quite interesting because if rho value is close to minus 1, then this term may become arbitrarily large. Now, what is the meaning of rho becoming, having, being minus 1? Is that you, you have negative correlated demand from one period to the other. So it means that in one period, you, if you have a very large demand, in the next period, you are expected to have a very low demand. Okay? In that case, your order size, the quantities that you order might be arbitrarily large and then arbitrarily low. So this is the case where the variance of orders is going to explode. Okay? You can see the, the reason. So this is actually one observation. The next observation, what happens if rho is equal to zero? Well, if rho is equal to zero, this term is going to vanish. So you're going to have uh, everything equal to zero. So if you don't have any correlation between demands, then you are not going to have boobip effect in this specific problem. Why? Because demand at that point becomes stationary. So it means that you, the quantities that, that comes as demands are always ordered, so you have exactly identical distribution with the demand. Okay? So this is also reasonable. Now, what happens if lead time is equal to zero? Well, if lead time is equal to zero, this term is going to be zero. So if nu is equal to zero, we still have this, this part is going to be, if this is zero, we have one minus rho, one minus rho squared, divided by 1 plus rho, 1 minus rho, the whole thing squared. So if you make the necessary uh, simplifications, we are going to end up with 2 rho sigma square. So even if the lead time is equal to 0, in other words, you don't wait anything until you receive the order that you have given, you are still going to have this bullwhip effect. Now, this is, this is a very important result in the sense that we said that one of the ways of coping with bullwhip effect is to reduce the lead time. Okay? But it turns out that even if you eliminate the lead time, if the demand is non-stationary, you are always going to have the bullwhip effect. Okay? So regardless of what you do best with respect to the operations, if in the nature of the demand process you have some kind of non-stationarity or dependency, you are always going to have bullwhip effect. Which means that we should never try to eliminate the whole bullwhip effect because it is probably in the nature of the system, uh, well, part of the bullwhip effect is within the nature of the systems that we are trying to control. Of course, the decreasing the lead time is definitely going to help reduce that bullwhip effect, but you cannot eliminate that bullwhip effect. So this is basically one thing which comes from this simple structured model, and we were able to show that actually this, the variances of the orders that we give uh, is always larger than the variances of the actual demand. Any questions on this? So if yes. If rho is close to one, if rho is close to one, what what's happening? Okay, then you have, an, an well, if if for example, nu is 
let's say, a small value. So this is going to be, become zero, almost very close to zero. Then you have another term which is very close to zero, because I am telling you that if nu is rather large, okay, then, uh, well, actually it's not going to change much, but if nu is large, then, uh, and we cannot have rho exactly equal to one, then this term may become very small, anyhow, regardless the value of rho, because you are sort of multiplying it. So if nu is reasonable, one, two, three, four, five, and if rho is very close to one, then this is very close to zero, this is very close to zero, and here we have two terms which are again very close to zero. So if the previous demand is high, for example, that makes demand Hi. But you, you see, uh, it is going to depend on mu, but my hunch is that you have two terms here where uh, the terms are, if you, if you look at these carefully, we, you, we have to take the limit, actually. Limit as rho goes to 1. Okay, so you, you can see that we have, here we have terms, which is rho to the power something, and here we have terms, which is rho to the power 2. Okay, so I, I, I don't know what will happen, but let's consider the case where, uh, well, if, if nu is equal to 0, we know that this is the limit. So if rho is equal to 1, you have 2 sigma square. Okay, you still have something. So as nu uh, goes to a larger value, probably I am expecting that uh, this is going to, to grow, actually. This is my expectation. But I didn't do that. It might be a nice exercise to work on. Take the limit as rho goes to 1 and see what you will have with this term. Okay, you can use, apply Opital's rule uh, a few times and, well, a couple of times will be enough probably. Okay, I don't know what will happen. You see, the, the, the problem is, of course, when the model is explained in the beginning, you exclude those cases. So, uh, taking a limit is only going to be sort of an approximation because I don't know what will happen. We might still have an undetermined case at the end. I don't know. But it, for rho minus 1, actually, it was easier to see the result. That's the reason why I, I talked about that and because it is very intuitive to see what's going on. Okay, any questions? Now, this is, this is a, a simple approach. You, you see, what we do in, in modeling is, is we do a number of things. This is a good example to generalize a certain idea. Now, one thing that we do with modeling is we try to find optimal solutions to certain decision problems. Okay? So here, in this case, well, we already had this embedded to this problem. But sometimes we do models, we prepare models in order to show that we have some kind of a hypothesis and we would like to show that that hypothesis is going to work in a rather general environment. So here actually the exercise that we had is of the second nature. So you have a certain, a certain model is established just to show that this bullwhip effect exists. Now following this paper there are probably tens of papers which show the bullwhip effect under various different environments and under various different conditions. This is, this is the bullwhip effect due to the non-stationarity of demand, but you might have different types of bullwhip effects. Okay? And for example, you might, we are going to see another bullwhip effect which comes from the production batching. Okay, any questions on this? So this is a, a good example in terms of how we are going to use these analytical models. It's not always we use them for optimization purposes, but you have a certain hypothesis. You observe certain things in real life. Okay, this is, partly it is called empirical research because you have some empirical data and you, you actually observe that the 
variances are getting larger in supply chains. So this is sort of something that you observe. Then you put a hypothesis saying that, well, this is called bullwhip effect. And then you try to measure that and sh try to show that it is somehow realistic. So you put forward a model which is much more, well, which is a reasonable model in general. It's not very, it shouldn't be very complicated, otherwise it would be very hard to get these variances. But at the same time, I think it serves its purpose. So this is in that respect a very nice uh, uh, approach to show some kind of a hypothesis. Now, if you are doing uh, work for uh, companies or organizations, this, is, this, step, this kind of a step would be the step that I would call to persuade them that they have some kind of a decision problem. In other words, what I would do is I would put some uh, simple, structured, reasonable model, show that you see with this model what you are actually doing is creating a lot of, let's say, variance. Okay? Now, if this, is the, if this is true, if you are persuaded by the results of this model, now let's sit down and work on your decision problem, but at least we have a direction to take. Okay, so this is actually something that can be used for those purposes as well. And this is the reason why this paper has been cited enormously. Okay, because I think it, it has a lot of different types of issue. Actually, in the paper, there are four models. This is model number one. Then there is another model, which, is, uh, which we are going to see on Tuesday. I'm not going to start. That's the reason why I'm taking a little bit of time. This was the talk that I wanted to make at the end, but I think I can put it now. And so we are going to see another model. Then there is a model where price change occurs. So there is a, dis a defined way of price change. And they are able to show that if there is a price change, the order quantities differ, and the variance becomes larger. And there is a fourth model where the total amount that can be supplied is restricted. And in those cases, what they have is they have a number of retailers ordering for this restricted supply. And there is a certain way that the supplier is going to allocate the quantity which is supplied to different retailers. Of course, it is going to depend on the quantity which is ordered by the retailers, but it is going to be a function of that. And so they explain a very simple game theoretic environment where uh, this happens and then show that under these circumstances, the quantities that they order because of the supply limitation is going to have larger variance than demand. Whereas you expect that it is going to be exactly demand because environment is stationary and the simplest environment where you have actually rho equal to zero. Similar environment, rho equal to zero, but restricted supply. So they solve a small Nash equilibrium kind of a problem and there is, there is a mistake in their derivation, but still, uh, I think it holds in general. Uh, but, uh, and they show that actually the variances are exceeding. Now, the model that we are going to see is on Tuesday is the so-called uh, production order batching problem. So the environment will be very simple. We are going to have a system where we are going to have end retailers. Okay, order batching. We are going to have N retailers. And each retailer is going to order a supplier. So the orders are going to be accumulated to the supplier. So every week, the supplier, depending on the orders that are coming from the retailer, is going to solve, uh, is going to supply that quantity. Of course, the demand that the supplier is going to see is going to depend on the order of the retailers. Now, we are going to see three cases. In case one, the retailers will be ordering randomly within, let's say, a week. In case two, they are all going to be ordering at the same time, which is usually the case in practice. If we're talking about Migros shops, they are always going to order, let's say, on, Tuesday, on Thursdays, so that everything will arrive Friday morning, 
and in Friday morning they will be serving their customers in the high demand days, which are, which are Friday, Saturday, and partly Sunday. And the third one will be, we are going to restrict the way that they are ordering, and we are going to compare the bull whip effect induced by these three different operating characteristics. Okay, any questions? Okay, I'll see you on Tuesday. So we have, we, we have finished before I thought because of this reason. So.